What's up, everybody? Andrew Clear from the F1 Podcast, bringing to you Season 3, Episode 2 of the F1 Podcast. I am joined today by Jonathan Ricci. Hello. And Erica Hollingsworth. What up, what up, what up? Aren't y'all excited? This is Week 1 of the season coming up. Woohoo! Ladies and gentlemen, it is race week. It is officially race week. 2023 is here. Some of us are excited. Uh, we have a good episode today coming up. We want to talk about what uh, the news, and we have a new segment coming up this week, kind of like the week that was uh, in F1, where we're going to talk about the latest news coming up in F1. Then we'll talk about our season predictions, as this is our preview show for this year. But then at the end of the episode, we're going to touch on Drive to Survive and what we thought our thoughts on Season 5 were before sending it off you know, to the Bahrain Grand Prix, where you can join us at Trinity Commons in Toronto on Kensington, Kensington Market this Sunday. Race starts at 10. Please book reservation in advance um, because they are expected to get a lot of people. But you can join the F1 podcast and watch the inaugural race of the 2023 season. What better way, right? Yeah, you, you took the words right out of my mouth, Andrew. <laughs> What better way to watch the first race of the season with our fans? Uh, we couldn't be more excited. Oh, there's been a lot going on, Andrew. There has quite a bit a lot going on this week. Uh, some good news, uh, some unfortunate news, but I think we should start with the great the great news to start off is that today F1 announced that uh, Susie Wolf, or uh, you know Total Total Wolf's uh, wife, also a previous Academy driver for Williams. Um, is now the managing director of the F1 Academy category, which aims to develop and prepare young female drivers to progress to higher levels of competition. This is huge, in my opinion, because we've seen how successful the W Series can be. Unfortunately, um, there was a financial outfall there last year at the end of the season once Jamie Chadwick uh, won the Drivers' Championship. I'm hoping that is not the case this year in that partnership with F1, but we're seeing, you know, substantial we're seeing significant uh female uh i say attention to the sport we're seeing them come through the ranks uh through you know the w series where uh we've had you know female academy drivers in f1 but also tatiana calderon competing in f2 last year Mm -hmm. which is great so erica what are your thoughts on this appointment to Susie? i am super excited for this i don't think it's like you said any secret that there's appetite and a lot of people are keen to see female drivers really reach some higher ranks get into some more competitive cars and into some more competitive racing and one of the great things i loved one quote that i saw from Susie that f1 shared which was saying it will inspire women to realize that there is no limit to what they can achieve and i really think that's true i mean like you said we saw some women moving into f2 for those who don't remember jamie chadwick in december did sign with nxt indycar uh so she will be in that series for andretti racing this coming year which is very exciting to see so it's it's really awesome like w series is very different i know a lot of people have compared it to some of the more developmental leagues for f1 drivers so i think it's time we have some kick-ass people who have done some crazy stuff in the past working to develop the next generation of talent and who knows maybe we'll have some reserve drivers at some point or some testers in the near future would which would i think be incredible um so i'm so also like it's I, you've all heard me talk before i i love Susie. it takes a good woman from open to deal with toto wolf so uh, <laughs> i think it'll be a, a a really great opportunity for her and i'm excited to see what comes of it she's been an amazing role model for the sport it, what great way to kind of kick off your wednesday seeing this kind of announcement you know we've seen her have such an impact in the drive to survive series and just seeing her kind of taking up a, like a leadership role in some of the episodes But what better way to pay off and continue to build the sport, especially for for women. So hats off, really excited for her and this new gig. So it looks like the F1 Academy overall schedule is going to be five teams. There will be, I believe, 15 drivers. So three three drivers per team, where 21 races are going to be hosted at F1 tracks. Uh, Seven rounds will be three. So three races at each round, starting at Spielberg in Austria and then ending in uh, Coda. In Austin, so it's going to be quite an op- a great opportunity here. I believe again, for, you know, to see that development on women's side because they have proven that you know there are quality racers. You know, it takes a lot of talent to become you know an academy driver or you know a reserve driver in the F one side, right? You are along with the best of the best, and to see that women just um, you know being able to progress towards into that um, you know spot, especially with Susie, she was like a pioneer and with Williams doing that role, I think it's going to be a really great opportunity. And she brings a lot of experience um, 
in terms of managerial structure and growth being that she was a team principal for the Venturi Formula E squad. No, and just to add to it, I knew that obviously like her working with Williams was a big deal, but I didn't realize until I looked it up today that when she raced in 2014 for Williams in Formula One, she was the first woman in 22 years to make an appearance in the sport. Pretty crazy stuff. So if anyone can do it, and if anyone can take us where we want to go, it's it's going to be Susie Wolf. Also, she's only 40. Yeah, I was she's... just going to say that. She's <laughs> killing it. She's so young. <laughs> Wait, she's four. I thought she'd be def- yeah, definitely younger than 40. She does not look 40. Now, one of the races that they're going to be, one of the tracks that they're going to be racing at this year is at Barcelona, which had some interesting news uh, this week as well. Mm-hmm. They are getting oh, rid of that crappy chicane at the end of the track <laughs> and finally make it what it once was just the curve around thank the f1 gods because that was one of the terrible parts of that overall track and really agree to see that they're adjusting that structure which is like currently the chicane at turn 14 15 before going into the pit lane it's now going to be that full wrap around should be should create a lot of fun of a lot more racing i think too there I think the real question is, will Carlos Sainz be able to take this corner or will he continue to take a different corner into a gravel pit? <laughs> to be fair, that corner is right at the gravel pit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it'll be some more exciting racing, especially like coming to the end if we have some close battles as opposed to having to slow down into a chicane, just absolutely gunner and try to make a good finish on every lap. So should hopefully see some good overtakes there as well. I think this is good to like, it's glad to see like the FIA and, um, you know, management understand that, you know, we want to see some more competitive racing. And when, when this kind of proposal came out, like, I think there was a lot of issues from the the community that didn't really like it. So, you know, I'll give them kudos where, where it's needed is that this was a much needed change uh, to the track. But I, I, I assure you the smooth operator, he's not going to get stuck in that gravel. I'll believe it when I see it. Now, Rishi, you play a lot of the F1 game. How excited are you to not have to drive that stupid chicane when, like, on an online race, and you can finally just gun it full around the corner? Andrew, I hate to break your heart, man. If I can get past turn one in any online race, it'd be smooth sailing, but it, it's never... I I honest, honest... Like, sorry, we're changing subjects here. Honestly, playing online, it's rough. You lose! <laughs> yeah, because it's best to start P20 and just let everybody crash in front of you and then you just kind of maneuver your way through. But if you don't move, then you get like a penalty or or, or something. So it's, yeah, it's, you just immediately just turn to the right and just try to get away from everybody. But <laughs> Well, unfortunately, on a somber note, it was reportedly that Lance Stroll, our, you know, our, our, the only Canadian on the grid this season, has broken both wrists in a cycling accident during that kept him out of preseason testing in Bahrain. I don't know how they were thinking that he was going to be able to compete with two broken wrists. I'm like, they're broken. Like, and you have to drive. What do you need to use? Like your, use your elbows. You can just like, <laughs> like bring in a whole new term to elbows out sort of idea. But there was a potential. I think there was a rumor that Mike Crack, he did contact Sebastian Vettel to come back, which would have been his 300th race at the Vare GP. Or, wow. But it looks like reserve driver Felipe Drogovic, Formula 2 reigning champion, will be taking that seat. On one hand, I'm ups- it's sad to see that Stroll, um, you know, uh, has had a rough start to the season. And, you know, he, I think he, he does get a lot of bad rap, but he has been able to perform when he's had a good car. And they have a good car this year. According to Tessie, they have a good car, but I'm excited to see what Felipe does in that car. I think he's got great race craft and we'll see what happens. Oh, geez. No, I think it would have been interesting to see Vettel and Alonso on one team. I could only imagine who is technically driver number one, but there's a lot of questions around Austin Martin and like, talk about a, talk about a good testing weekend. It really blew a lot of people uh, out out of proportion that thought maybe this is not Austin Martin's year. But I mean, Daddy Stroll said it was 2025 uh, that they will maybe challenge for championships. But there's a lot of I can see Austin Martin on a lot of predictions going up after this weekend. Um, I mean, it'll be interesting if Felipe, uh, sorry, not Felipe, um, Drogovic was able to steer that car into the season. But yeah, that kind of threw me off. Go ahead, Erica. Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's okay. Yeah, I'm I'm really hopeful that obviously Stroll makes a good recovery, but also worth noting, uh, one of my coworkers pointed this out this week. This is the first time in several years we've had a Brazilian driver on the grid. Like as much as 
uh, Felipe will be a reserve driver. We haven't had, and I mean, Lewis Hamilton does have his honorary Brazilian citizenship as well, but this is the first time we've had like a true Brazilian driver on the track racing for a team in quite some number of years. And it's a country that's produced a notable number of drivers over the years. So hopefully this is just showing that there's some up and coming young talent coming out of the country. And uh, we have more exciting things to look forward to in the next couple of years from uh, Drogovic and others. Last Felipe, last, well, I guess the last Brazilian driver to be on the grid was also a Felipe, Felipe Massa, who retired, I believe, 2017. So it's good to see that uh, for Drogovic coming up. Yeah, it's been quite a few, it's been quite a few years, especially while the racing scene in Brazil, especially with Interlagos, and, you know, is how iconic it is there. So it's great to see uh, Drogovic come through the rank. And finally, you know, seeing an F2 champion get a chance to race in the year after which he won. Yeah, for sure. That's something that we've been missing the last couple of years. Everyone's had to wait a year or two in order for a seat to open or even to get the reserve driver seat. So nice yeah. to see that promotion and that opportunity open itself up sooner than later so that was the week that was in f1 for now for now <laughs> <laughs> a lot can change between wednesday and a saturday or sunday that's for sure exactly but now it's time we've come to the nitty-gritty people uh, let's get ready to rumble it is our f1 season preview Oof. there's gonna be some hot takes there's gonna be some wild predictions but i am curious to hear everybody's thoughts on their predictions coming season. So Erica, why don't you take it away with your overall thoughts? All right. Well, um, so in terms of my predictions, what I think we stand to see, the three that I've come up with, uh, first and foremost, I think Red Bull will be the dominant team that comes out on top yet again. Um, I don't think anyone's really surprised to see that after how well they adapted to the new regulations last year and what we saw in testing this year especially when Max put so many laps on the car as a means, uh, not just to test reliability, I'm sure, but uh, looking good on that front after some of the hiccups we had early in the season last year. Second, I think we are going to see McLaren take a bit of a tumble. I am not shocked to say that. I think they'll, my, I think that we're going to see them probably closer to the bottom, like uh, others have been saying. I mean, there's the rumors that Lando put his fist through a wall. The gaffer tape came out. I'm not feeling hopeful about this car, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I think Lewis Hamilton will also win not only his first race since the 2021 season, but he will win multiple races. I feel like the Mercedes is looking pretty good, so I am hopeful that we'll see more of that. And my hot take, which, uh, you know, it's unproven and it's what we've yet to see, is that Aston Martin will be challenging Mercedes for that third place in the construction oh, wow. championship. Ooh, can that you say that again a little louder for the people in the back, uh, particularly John? Aston Martin will be challenging Mercedes for third place in the constructors championship. Oh, oh. I really hope. <laughs> I really hope you guys double DNF the first race and I could just ah. like, laugh at you the whole time, but it's okay. I'm a Ferrari fan. So what, yeah, I, what can we know? Just reviewing you know, I'm... on that, it, it, it's crazy to think how like a T, like, Aston Martin was so bad to begin 2022 and that they finally adopted that green bull sort of mentality. And it, the car literally looks like the RB18, <laughs> but man, is it quick? They were the second, I compared to last year, They've gained the second most, or they're the sec, like their second terms of gaining most time compared to testing and then where they were last year. So Williams, I think, gained about 2.7 seconds or 2.3 seconds, sorry, uh, compared to last year's car in testing. And then Aston Martin was around 2.2, 2.3 as well. So very exciting to think that they gained two seconds compared but you know testing is testing because people sandbag all the time in testing mercedes yeah. does it all the time which you know is entirely possible but regardless that car has improved substantially for aston martin over the course of the last year so i'm hopeful that even though they didn't have a great car last year we did see some pretty good results from seb and from lance so if they've made progress on the car plus uh we've got alonzo in seat who we know is a bit of a beast behind the wheel and hopefully lance makes a swift and full recovery but even just to see an f2 champion we've seen some really great stuff from the guys that have come up out of that league over the last few years oh that was that was very upper canada so the way that came out. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Erica, my, my true question to you, though, is considering how much of the drama of the previous F1 season that McLaren was involved in, 
you know, with Oscar Piastri, you know, the uh, effectively shunning of Daniel Ricardo. Are are you are you a little? I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but it, it's got to be a tough time for McLaren fans, considering that they're more worried about this sort of drama than they are in terms of making a competitive card because a lot of pundits were saying like this is really bad like they are in a bad spot to begin the season and their packages could be coming well later maybe five six rounds in (laughs) and but from mclaren who was battling for say p3 two years ago to like being in the bottom three this year is crazy if you're lando norris you were already kicking yourself for what happened at Sochi in 2021. But knowing the type of car you've driven last year and are likely going to drive this year, you're kicking yourself even more <laughs> because you realize that you may have lost your only opportunity <laughs> at that first place win for quite some time to come if you stick with uh, the team that you're on right now. Hard time, but I don't think I've really shied away from this. In my mind, it's kind of karma because they, they did do Danny Rick dirty last year in my opinion if you're Danny Rick you're like heck yeah I jumped ship at the right time who cares if I'm a reserve driver for Red Bull this is the way to do it so uh hopefully I again like always optimistic and hopeful that they turn it around I wish nothing but good things for Piastri's first season as a starting driver for a Formula One team but I don't know you just kind of look at McLaren and you're like well what did you think was going to happen if this is how you were managing your affairs they were the team that completed the least amount of laps Gotta love that. If they like the gaffer tape is just like really come on. Yeah, and I don't think Zach Brown's really having any easy sleeps right now no. going into the season. No. So we'll we'll see what's what. All right. Well, John, would you like to share your season predictions? Sure. Yeah. I, I think I have some pretty easy ones. And I think this is pretty self-explanatory based off the testing this weekend. Uh I call I'm calling that Verstappen's gonna win his third F1 title um in a row. I think. This is, might be bold. Ferrari's going to win the Constructors title. And I think for the first time since 2008, I think it's going to be very competitive in those top four uh, drivers. But my mind is very... I'm curious to see if Sergio Perez is going to continue playing that little bit of a player, uh, a, like a teammate, per, per se. And that kind of goes into my third prediction. This is going to be the year of team fighting internally. I feel like a lot of teams or drivers are going to fight each other a lot. I mean, I don't see how an Alpine, two French drivers, going to Ocon and Pierre are going to do very well. Austin Martin, you know, with an Alonso and also Lance Stroll with the dad owning the team. Haas, everyone can remember. Hulkenberg and Kevin Magnussen. Uh, I can't really repeat the, re- uh, repeat the words that were said uh, in an interview, but uh, <laughs> let's just say that I think there's going to be some tension I don't know if there's really going to be any drivers that are going to be really wanting to work together uh, per se, but I think there's going to be a lot of internal fighting this year. And heck, maybe Drive Survive will eat it up if they can, but it'll be interesting. This is really tough, but I think uh, my bold prediction was going to be if Sebastian Vettel returns, and I thought it was literally going to happen right now. But I honestly, my my bold prediction is Zach Brown's going to be out of McLaren if they don't do well this year. I think the writing is on the wall. You know, we saw his... Uh, you know, we saw him testing, doing the least amount of laps, um, the drivers complaining on the radio. It looks pretty bleak for uh, the team in orange, but... Now, John, you right. mentioned a lot of in-team fighting as kind of your overall, you know, prediction. Uh, Fred Vesser did come, I think it was in an interview with Ted Kravitz, <laughs> that he do that, he mentioned that it's a good thing that Ferrari has two number one drivers this season. So... Do you anticipate any infighting within the team at Ferrari this year? I think definitely if I was Carlos Sainz, I'd feel a little little down or a little like I need to prove myself um, because of the close relationship that uh, Fred and Charles had uh, when he was uh, in the junior team. You know, that was a very good response. No, I have two number one drivers, and that's why maybe I'll give them a little bit of an edge in in the sense that, you know, maybe – uh, Perez is still kind of bitter um, at certain moments, like in Brazil last year, just when Max was kind of really pressuring, like when he didn't really need to. Carlos was not afraid to admit that he's like, if I'm going to go for the win, I will go for the win. When, and we saw that at the British Grand, British Grand Prix. So it, that will be an interesting first couple of races to see how that dynamic goes. And like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Probably there will be some eye, uh, eyebrows or people will point to Ferrari as a potential team fighting too. Um, now, Eric, 
Erica, based on what John mentioned about how he feels that Zach Brown is going to be out as CEO, there's a lot of talk about Mario Andretti coming into the sport. Do you see at any chance that if, because we've, we've, we've always been wanting this 11th team on the grid, he's been just trying this darnest to get on the F1 grid, but maybe it might be another opportunity to go inside McLaren's spot. Like, I understand that Zach brings a lot of advertising and a lot of sponsorship dollars to McLaren, but at what point, at, you know, at some point, the performance needs to, you know, bang up to the dollar that they've been requesting. So do you think that could be an opportunity if Zach Brown were to leave? There's two things here. I do agree that I think if McLaren has another abysmal year that Brown is out for sure, especially when they were on the precipice of something great and absolutely fumbled the bag last year. I don't know that I see this as being how Andretti gets into the sport. Uh, there's been a lot of talk this week specifically about entering through Cadillac on the Chevy side of things and working on a proposal that way. And he's really intent on it being an American team. So as much as Zach Brown is American and running McLaren and uh, he even like Andretti is even pointed to Haas, like, yeah, Gene Haas is the majority owner, but they're using parts from Mercedes, which is a German car company. And they have drivers who are not American. Like he is dead set on this being like a hardcore American venture. So unless there was really kind of a drastic change in McLaren's kind of capital where a lot of the money that they need in order to operate the team is gone and someone can be like a majority owner by purchasing a stake in it and Andretti can maybe get more of the American drivers in there, which kind of makes me wonder what might happen with Logan Sargent and others at that point. <laughs> Um, I, I don't see that as being his way into it. I think he would still really push for that 11th team. You know, any anything's possible, but I, I do think that if McLaren performs poorly this year, like Richie said, Brown is out for sure. Well, that's good. So, okay. okay actually, before side. before you start, okay, Austin Martin winning everything is not, this is not like amateur mode <laughs> on Formula One. No, no, no. They're not going to win everything. They'll win, they'll win a race or two this year, I think. I like. I think based on what was testing, the, the long race runs, especially if they did on day three, they had really great pace in the race runs. And that's what, so a lot of and that, that's kind of always been their thing. They've been terrible in quality, but then they've been able to do very good race runs throughout. You've seen this the past couple of seasons. So they need to get over this hump in the qualification aspect and be able to set up a car that's good for both. Cause they've clearly been able to demonstrate that they're good on the race pace side, but not in the quality pace side. I think with Fernando, they've really been able to change some of that ideology, especially, and then with Vettel's, Null and you know bringing up from last year and him working with the team for the past couple of seasons, I think they're going to have that competitive car that can uh, do well in both case scenarios. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, and then another while, I I think I'll, I'll, it's part of my hot take, but I think Alonso is going to have an incredible year at Aston Martin. But first and foremost, for my predictions, I agree with everybody. I think Max Verstappen is going to win the World Drivers Championship, and I think it's going to be one another blowout where he's going to win it by Circuit of the Americas in the United States with about four or five rounds to go. He's going to win. Just, just I think they looked so comfortable in testing this week. Like they, it was so hard for them to hide back all their smiles, and like you could tell how giddy they were. So I, I really do think that Max is going to have another dominant season. Uh, he's really, we're really seeing kind of um, as much as I don't think, I think a lot of fans don't want to hear this, but I think Max Verstappen is going to be like the next Lewis Hamilton coming through in terms of how, it, how strength of race and world drivers championships. So but it's just, it's tough to see how that's not, but that's number one. Uh, number two, I think just based on testing, there was a lot of re like result. We had like Alpha, we had like Joe being like, you know, top driver of the day in terms of quick, or quickest driver of the day in one of the days. But the, a lot of the midfield has gained a lot of speed. And I think that's had to do with the regulation. So I really think the midfield is going to be wide open for um, season this year, where between fourth and eighth place, sounds interesting, it'll be separated by 20 points. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity there for the midfield battle to come, where we could see a lot of different people scoring points every weekend um, in that midfield. So I, it'll be curious to see. But then, uh, and then associating with that, I think there's going to be seven different winners on the F1 grid this year. Last year, we had five, um, you know, both Ferrari drivers, both Red Bull drivers, and uh, Russell. 
but I think yep. you know Lewis is going to win a race this year, and I this leads into my hot take. Ooh. I think Fernando Alonso is going to win more races this year than Carlos Sainz does. Hot dang! Yeah, I'm I I am all in on the Kool Aid this year for Aston Martin. I just I think they had such a strong test. Their car looks a lot like the RB18, and guess what? The RB18 did a lot last year. Win, win, <laughs> win, win. So uh, Fernando looks energized. He looks he looks ready to go. There's been a lot of talk about. There's been a lot of hype within the paddock about Aston Martin. So I think let's let's see how it goes. My hope is just that they don't end up like McLaren last year, where where they were really strong in testing, and then we got to the race, and it was like, bro, what happened? So, but like you said, the RB18 did awesome stuff. This car appears similar. Let's just hope it's not like the. Like I mean, it's gonna be a real massive. kick in the teeth if like they finish P14 and P15 this weekend. It's like showing up to the Olympics and getting ready to do a 10 meter high dive and then belly flopping into the pool if they don't. Do well <laughs> Pretty much, that that's what exactly it's gonna be like. <clears throat> Again, reliability is always an issue with the car. They did, mind you, they did the eighth least amount of laps this week but they did do a pretty heavy day three um so a very pretty heavy final day again we'll find out what it's going to be like but i think uh yeah i think in the battle of spain this year alonso is going to take it against science in terms of race wins i'd love to see it hey let's get to the next thing um, <laughs> uh what are we doing next are we doing the rankings yeah, so this is another fun part of our F1 season predictions. We're collectively going to predict the drivers and constructors' standings this season. So there's going to be a lot of debate coming up here, but I think this will be a lot of fun. Let's do so it. Let's do it. All right. We'll start off with the drivers' championship to begin with. Who do you think is going to be P1? I think Max, it's a, Max, 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 yeah, let's take Max first staff and joining an illustrious club. P2, I'm Pippin Charles Leclerc. In my opinion, yeah, I think he's gonna do the signs. Yeah, I'm gonna go number two for Leclerc as well. That's what I have on my list. Last year was definitely a learning curve for him, and I think he was able to be a better driver. And also, I think the team has kind of hopefully realized the mistakes they made last year. And I hope Fred really kicks the can. And so, I do definitely see a little bit more win races, uh, race wins by him this year. Um, definitely more than next last year, but I think it'll be. I think Max will win by hefty margin, but I wouldn't say it's as hefty as it was last year. Though. Yeah, I do Erica? think that the pressure will be on Charles from Checo, though. Um, I just still think that that... I mean, we saw last year Checo perform pretty well, even though the naysayers were after him. Like, get off your high horse. He's doing great. Um, so I think he's still going to be pushing because he's hungry. We saw it last year. Checo really wants to give it all he can and he wants to challenge max if it's possible so uh even though i mean the ferrari it looks to be in good standing and like richie said i think charles has learned a lot i think checo will be hot on his heels so i'm, well, I'm good with been... that p2 but what about p3 so who do you think is going to be the better than perez or science oh perez. i think in my opinion the first the, the p1 through p4 are going to be ferrari and red bull yeah again yeah i don't see i don't see mercedes cracking that top four um because I don't think I, I think they have the third best car coming into the season. Yep, I'm I'm aligned with that. But I know if we're duking it out between Checo and Sainz here, I still don't think that Sainz is quite matured enough as a driver in order to challenge and maybe push to be a little higher in those standings, especially compared to Checo, who is the unofficial defense minister of Mexico. Uh, so for that reason, I would put Checo at P3 and Sainz at P4. I, I think I, for me on my list, I believe that Carlos is going to be number three, but I think it would just be at the whiskers. Like it's going to be either like two under 10 points. Like, I think it's going to be a battle between these, whether if it's max just in the front it, bait, bait of fighting Charles and just these two are going to go at it. But like, obviously I think we'll, when we get to the constructors, if Carlos comes third, then I believe that maybe Ferrari will win the constructors, but we'll get to that. So very good point um if i'm I, I might be wrong but i'm pretty sure carlos beat checo last year in the driver's championship no no uh perez uh won he was third oh uh -huh. okay well, that makes it easy we're gonna go <laughs> check <Checo> third <laughs> russell russell finished ahead of signs last year take that in oh that is but to be fair, they had a lot of reliability issues at Ferrari last year, which cost them a severe amount of points. Had Russell had fewer podiums, and he still finished ahead of signs. 
reliability issues. I know, but I'm just saying. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. So I guess that leaves. So we have Max P1, Charles P2. Um, I broke the tie and says Sergio and Carlos are P3 and P4 respectively. Is it safe to say Mercedes are going to be P5, P6? How mm-hmm. how much are you banking on Aston Martin is the question. Are you thinking well, P7? I don't know. I, this, is, this is a collective effort. To be honest with you, I think Fernando's going to finish P7 or P6, P7. I think he'll win a couple of races. Again, it's just going to be such a, a dog for the midfield. I, I, I want to drink the Kool-Aid. I really do want to drink the Kool-Aid on <laughs> Aston Martin, but I need to see them be able to perform both on Saturday and Sunday. Fair. Otherwise it just, it, it, it won't work out. So I am very confident that they'll do much, much better than they will last year. I think they finished P4 in the constructors. But with that said, I think we have Alonzo finishing P7 and the two Mercedes are going to be battling it out in P5, P6. Yeah, I'd agree. A uh, big question, like obviously last year, Russell finished higher than Lewis. Russell finishing P4, uh, Lewis being P6. How do we think that's going to shake out this year? Do we think Hamilton's going to be hungry and he's going to be looking to spearfish the guy who did the spearfishing last year? He is a seven-time world champion for a reason. He's not. I don't think he's going to just let Russell slide. He's going to make him work for it. So I did on mine. I did have Russ. I did have Lewis as P five and Russell as P six. I think Lewis at the beginning of last year was very much uh, a setup guinea pig for Mercedes, and he tried everything. Right, he tried every setup, yeah. and I think they kind of gave george the better end of that because he was such a young driver gaining the confidence and you know trying to give lewis that opportunity because there was a lot of sympathy i think there from the mercedes team so with that said i think lewis is gonna showcase why he's a seventh world he's a seven time world drivers champion i believe he's gonna finish p5 i'm with you on that i'm keen to see what comes of it lewis hamilton finishing p5 and george russell finishing p6 now, you all know what my thoughts are on P7. What are your thoughts are on P7? I think P7 could be Alonso because he finished P9 last year in the Alpine, which was a racy car with the straight line speed. But what we're seeing from the Aston Martin right now makes me more optimistic than seeing Ocon pop up from a P8 to a P7 or Gasly have, pulling a similar result. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm with you. I'm feeling Alonso on this one. P7 was Lando Norris last year. And let's be real, that's not, uh, that's not how it happened. <laughs> what, are your thoughts? what are your thoughts, Regie? I actually had an Alpine driver. Um, so I had Ocon um, just because I think that it was going to be very competitive for that P4 spot between Alpine and Austin Martin. So I think anything in between 7 and 10 or 7 to 11, it's all going to be very close to each other. So yeah, I, what did I say? Akon for P7? I had Akon for P7. When I was looking originally, I had Alonzo P7, Akon P8, Gazi P9, and then with Stroll being kind of P10, P11, but with Alonzo getting enough points to nip Alpine there for P4, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I would anybody... say Alonzo P7, Akon P8. Personally. All right. All right. I, I, I can get behind that. I can get behind that. I was like, how, how do we determine this if there's no one agreement? Is just what is it just because you're controlling democracy? It? Or are you just <laughs> or are you just Andrew, two versus one? <laughs> Andrew's in charge of the spreadsheet, so he gets to decide what gets written down. Lando <laughs> Norris, P20. You lose. <laughs> um P9. Um, what are your thoughts? Now, this is a little spicy mm-hmm. and a bit of a jump. I like it. But I like spicy. Based on the car and how I'm so hopeful <laughs> about his performance in the car, I'm saying Pierre Gasly. Ooh, yeah, I have that. Let's do it. You know, I was th- I, I, I was saying, I, I was thinking Pierre. Do you know who also could be kind of that P9? And it, it maybe I had Bottas. I was I gonna bo- say Bottas. <laughs> <laughs> that car, I think, is actually is it, it, it. It's a very competitive car this year. It's also looks sexy oh my god that alpha gives me feelings but my thing is is that relatively speaking for the kind of performance i'm expecting of a p9 car and driver like yes botas is great but i still feel like the alpha is kind of unproven where and they did have some reliability issues last year whereas gasly had similar issues but that was in the alpha towery he's no longer driving that alpine had greater success so i feel better and feel like it's going to be a stronger start to the season hopefully getting some early points in that little 
French thing that he's driving now. No, I think that's I think that's a very good assessment. I believe, and I I agree with you. I, we have we all have Pierre Gasly P nine. Yeah. So who rounds out P ten? Who rounds out the top ten in your opinion? No. Uh, yeah, I go Bottas then. I think he's gonna. I had Bottas as nine. I I think the Alpha like his team is gonna do much better this year. I think so. I I had Bottas as nine and ten. So I'm comfortable giving P10 to Bottas. He seems yeah. more relaxed uh, in this team, a little bit better, feel more comfortable without like the, the stress on. Third fastest lap in all of testing, and when they were always doing like their quality runs on day three. He was point. He was point five. He was like five tenths away from Perez, who was P one. So, and, and they've gained the third most amount of time from compared to last year's car and this year's testing. So, again, but it can. But the again, reliability. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a big word, reliability. And apparently, they were having reliability issues with the Ferrari engine at the end of testing. Oh so, my God! Let's see what happens. But I agree, P10 for Valtteri Bottas. All right, to recap, everybody, the top ten we got: we have Max Verstappen when he gets third in his row. We got Charles Leclerc finishing P2, Sergio Perez being P3, Carlos Sainz P4, Hammer and Russell being P5, P6, Alonso in P7. Then we have the Alpine teammates of Alcon and Gasly in P8 and P9, respectively, followed by Valtteri Bottas at P10. Now. Stick me in a fjord and get me ready for this thing. Jeez. <laughs> P11. I believe once he returns healthy, it will be Lance Stroll. Because Lance will have a competitive car with Aston Martin. The only issue is, is I don't know how long he will need in order to come back mm-hmm. from uh, double break, double wrist broken. So I had Stroll slash second Aston Martin driver for 12. Because That's like probably I, is I, fair, to be honest with you. I think I, yeah. if you combine the two together... Um, in this case scenario, I would do like the stroll slash second AM driver because of his injury. It's just so unknown. I was confident in Joe for ten, uh, for P11 because I think he has a lot more to prove. And um, I think there was a lot of mis... In- he had a lot of misfortunes. Sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. Last year, uh, a lot of things didn't really go his way. And I believe that he can make it a little bit interesting. So I can't, I, that's what I felt like for Joe is he's going to be whatever it was, P11, what we had there. We lost the sheet, but yeah. Love to see Joe finish P11. He was P18 last year, but struggled way more than Bottas did with reliability for his car last year. It would warm my heart, but I just, I don't know. Like if we're putting Bottas, like the seasoned driver who knows how to pull it around when a car is failing him a little in P10, even if it's a pretty good car, I don't know that I'm willing to put my money behind him for P11 just yet. Uh, I was going to go a little off the board here and pick it sounds interesting but i was actually gonna pick lando norris for p11 because my thoughts on this are i know mclaren has had a bad car but lando is too good of a driver um in his nature that i think he can take that bad car and score some form of points on a weekend with them i'm i'm aligned similarly like he still finished p7 in the championship standing last year in that car and it was not a banner year for the team i i trust in his talent to produce some points i don't think they're necessarily going to be pushing for podiums a lot especially not in the first couple of races of the season but I just think his talent will be enough to hopefully I know even I said that they're going to really take a tumble down but I I think he's comfortable enough in a McLaren car in general at this stage of the game that with an underperforming car he'll be able to finish P11 what are your thoughts on that Richie could you get behind that yeah we can do that that was not very convincing <laughs> <laughs> Well, Lando Norris, maybe a little bit of a hot take, finishing P11 with I, Ricci I, and having the 12th being Stroll slash the second AM driver. Yeah, I'm into that. I think that just makes sense with where the car is at right now. It, it could it could be a competitive season, but it also depends on how healthy, if Lance Stroll can come back and if they end up going with their res- reserve tri- uh, driver, Dr- Drugovich, if I'm pronouncing it. I think he'll still have a little bit of a learning curve to kind of get into that's why i think for sure it'll be a little bit lower than uh where alonso is now so for me for p13 i had an idea of who the bottom five were going to be um despite i think their growth this year in terms of how many laps i did and what their testing looked like i don't i just i can't trust williams to be out of the bottom two this year and i also don't think alpha tauri is in another position (laughs) 
to get out of the bottom two. I think DeVries is a very good driver, but you can only do so much when you drive a boat on track. <laughs> and I don't know if Yuki is going to be able to overcome some of that the, the the changes with you know him leaving his best friend you know when his best friend going to lp you know he was very distraught about it so i don't know what that dynamic is going to be like so um with that said those kind of two teams are out p13 i actually had my first half driver i thought kevin magnuson was going to be in the p13 oh, yeah. range i think he has a lot to prove too and um, i think there's going to be with obviously nico hulkenberg coming back um he probably wants to ensure that he's still the number one driver for the team so i had him magnuson actually as a p11 so p13 seems pretty reasonable to me yeah i'm game for that and haas was even saying last year they kind of stopped making improvements to the car to put everything behind the contender for this year and we've seen good stuff so far i also believe he finished p13 last year too right like that's that's with what they ended up doing finishing p13 seems well within the range of possibility now, did you see what Haas did with their pit wall no no oh so traditionally on the pit wall they have about seven different people six different people oh yeah with like the screen Haas has reduced this down to three what yes so it is like a dugout sort of style cubby hole where only three of them are going to be on the on the wall and the engineers are going to be back with the team so that there's no um, disruption in terms of data being transferred mm. being transferred and with that i think they believe they said they can save up towards a fight 250,000 to 500,000 dollars in freight costs which they then can then put into their development budget to help with what they had with issues last year huge with their green initiatives too to reduce carbon emissions based on their freight uh it gives them five hundred thousand dollars more to spend on the car which i think is a great i i think it, it, it's really cool to see like teams you know the small market teams like has who don't have a lot of money you know they're the ones that are the most innovative in their approach right because they have to figure out a way to spend get the most out of their dollar and i think this is a great opportunity uh to do that plus they probably won't have to spend a lot of, you know fingers crossed knock on wood they won't have to spend a lot of money on repairing the vehicle as much as they had to last year with a certain um person that's no longer with the team but yeah. so we Kevin Magnuson P13 who are your thoughts on P14 I feel like we were bringing up Joe earlier mm-hmm. I feel like the guy's earned a spot a little higher on a grid than he got last year yeah let's go with Joe I like that I just want him to do well I think he's a lovely person well, he's competing with Lewis Hamilton for best uh, dressed on the on the grid. That's for sure. No kidding. Uh, P15, I think uh, this one will be Nico Hulkenberg. Yep. Coming back. And I know, again, he's been, he's been away from his year of Formula One. Um, but, you know, he's an experienced driver. Uh, I think Haas have a better lineup this year with regards to um, overall stability in the team. They won't make as many mistakes. Uh, and I think they're going to be they're going to be competitive at times. I think they're going to be really competitive at the beginning of the year, like they were last year. But again, their money budget is going to be limited towards the end of the season, where we'll see the other teams come up against them, and they won't be finishing in the point. So that's why I say like. Um, you know, Magnuson P13, Hulkenberg P15 in that case. Yeah, I'm keen to say it. And we've seen people take a step back and come back hungrier and really kind of push once they return to F1. So I, I don't think he'll be an exception in that regard. I think he'll follow suit. Like he wanted to come back and he's going to do it. So here's hoping the Haas gives him some points and some good results. All right, Ryan Green's kit. Nico Ulkenberg. Ulkenberg. Being... I, I think I think the wild card for Nico Hulkenberg is like since he hasn't really been in a car in a couple of years, I was kind of favoriting in mine. I had Piastri, DeVries, Albon ahead of Hulkenberg. I think DeVries really proved himself in his first race and I think Oscar is a is a talented driver, but I can understand the arguments here. I'll agree with so you. We do have five racers left. We do have DeVries, we have Sonoda, we have Piastri. And then we have um, Sergeant and Albon. So do we want to do P20 up? Yeah, let's do P20 yeah, up. Yeah, let's so do it. Who is yeah. going to finish last? I kind of think it's going to be Logan Sergeant. I, I think just it's nothing against him. I think Formula One, it's going to be a learning curve. Obviously, Williams is, is they're one of the lower teams in Formula One at the moment. So I think it only makes sense that, you know, experience, uh, not the higher performing cars. It makes sense for him to be uh, P20. And I think he will st- get points somewhere in the season because I'm not saying that it's going to be complete zeros. I'm going to say maybe under 10 points. 
I agree. I think, you know, as a rookie, you'll need to prove yourself coming in. You know, Williams, they did they did show some promise in testing. You, who knows how that translates or how it's going to translate to the race, right? So I, I, I agree with that. Logan Sargent being P20 should be a quite an interesting time. Mm-hmm. Who's going to finish just ahead of him then in your thoughts? I had Matt, Alex Albon. I had really? double, I had double uh, Williams of mine. Yeah, I struggle just based on the performance of William, I can, Williams, sorry, I can see that, but Yuki's mental fortuity in the sport brings things into question with an underperforming Alpha Tauri. I don't know if he's got a sports psychologist, but whoever it is, I don't think they're doing a good job. <laughs> so I had, yeah, I, I could go either way on that. Albon, I think is like a pretty strong driver. So if there's opportunity to kind of go for it, I do see him coming out ahead. I'm with you on that one, Erica. I think it's going to be Yuki being P19. I just, I think, you know, with, without, he, he has proven himself to be a good racer in the past. I don't think AlphaTauri have a good car and there's going to be a big power struggle between who's going to be P1. I think Nick DeVries is going to come in and take over that role and uh, who, what I don't know what that's going to uh, do to Yuki, both from a driver's sense and from a mental standpoint. So unfortunately, if I'm going to have him, I would say P19 for Yuki uh, this year. Yep. Okay. I do not think that Albon would go much higher than P18, though. I will say that based on. Do you think DeVries all the better season than Albon? Kind of, yeah. With the will, like we saw him last year with Williams, like barely any experience in an F1 car, and the guy took that and got points with it. Like. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think I think he's in a good spot potentially do better than than Alvin I would agree because I think on championship pedigree too as well we have DeVries being a Formula E champion as well so he understands what it takes to win races and apparently he's done a lot for the development of the car so like after the in Abu Dhabi last season after the race fit after the season finished they do like that kind of like day of testing where you know guys go on loan sort of idea and he was giving a lot of feedback on the car which apparently has made a lot of people's eyebrows raise up so uh, he's he means business at the team again i just don't think they have i just don't think they have the capacity to make to give him a competitive car i i think he will finish better than albon well just based on you know that kind of pedigree and racecraft debris 100 percent. just gonna go with that <laughs> i love it <laughs> So we got Alex Easy Albon peasy pick. P18. So the battle for P16 has now come down to two people. We have Oscar Piastri, the reigning form, well, former Formula 2, former Formula 3 champion versus uh, Nick DeVries, who I believe won in Formula 2 and in Formula E. I have I have Oscar going ahead. I think he it's going to be a very close battle between both of them. I'm going to give Oscar the edge by under five points. I think they're going to be battling a lot in the in the bottom bottom half midfield. So let's let's see it let's see it happen. I think they're both quality drivers. Maybe maybe things turn around for McLaren, but I'm hopeful. I think this would be a good good matchup for the season. I I think the same thing. I think it's Piastri at P16 and Debris at P17. Again, the McLaren's not performing well, but Piastri is a talented driver, and I do believe that in terms of de- further developing the car throughout the season to perform, McLaren does have a leg up. It it would be really exciting. Exciting if it came close because, as Richie said, the caliber of Debris is going to definitely put some pressure on things. But for sure, uh, Piastri P16 and Debris P17 on my end. Sounds like a plan to me. So there we have it. We have locked <laughs> our grid. Oh my the, God. For this season. We uh, made it. We came so far. We will post this online. We'll do a quick constructors championship because that won't that will take as long. So I think. A lot of it will be based on what we've provided in the the drivers championship, but we will post our we will post both of our predictions on our Instagram page for you to follow along, and you can either comment whether you think they're good or where you think they're utter uh, tomfoolery. But oh, we're gonna get roasted for sure. I was gonna <laughs> say there's gonna be some strong. Also, before we dive into con- the constructors, is it me or when you see Nick spelled with a Y instead of Nick, do you hear Nick? in your head because that's just <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's not nick it's nick like a formula one car going yeah <laughs> <"Nick." laughs> all right onwards and upwards to the constructors championship prediction so we can agree p1 aston martin love no, it barrel roll. <laughs> no. get get that garbage out of yeah. here no 
All right, so Red Bull. Red Bull or Ferrari? Ferrari. No, I say right. Red Bull. Uh, it's going to be Red Bull, John. I don't know what you're talking about. Ferrari are going to finish P2 again. Look how good the Red Bull car was in testing. And also purely based on the math for the most part of like what we're seeing in the Drivers' True. Championship, we put the two Red Bull drivers combined ahead of the two Ferraris. Just the 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 math wouldn't math. Yeah, okay, all right, all right, Ferrari. Right. <laughs> Ferrari P2. You know what, John? I will give you the honors to pick P3 and P4. Based on this, we're going to go Mercedes P3. Okay. Let me see for P4. I'm going to go P4 Alpine. And That's then P- fair. That's P5, fair. I, I will accept that. I think, personally, Aston Martin is going to be P4. It's challenging Mercedes for P3, but it all depends on the second driver. It really yeah. Yeah, I think Alonso's a lock, but it, all, it really depends on how well the second driver performs. I think he will get a Let's decent see. amount. He'll be the point carrier for the team. Um, but that caveat is what we talked about is going to be if Lance Stroll returns and obviously. Yeah, I'd is. agree with that for sure. So LPP4, would you say then the the best, I say the top five Aston Martin just yeah. based yeah. on that? Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, that will be a step up from last year. I will take that, to be honest with you. I will well, take they, the top five finish in the and constructors. It'll, it'll be a close fight, I think. So even if they are P5, it won't be a far P5. No, I I, I totally agree. Well, especially every placement that they get in constructors gets them more money and either less time or more time in the wind factory, if I'm saying wind, that yeah. correct. Wind tunnel. It'll wind be tunnel. interesting Thank you. to see. Um, <laughs> I, I, this, this is probably a year or two long, but I think 2024 is the year where we see that flip between Ferrari and Red Bull, just based on what will happen in terms of the cost structure. or the. Or, 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 I, I just don't know if that wind tunnel time will be effect. It'll take two years to kind of take into effect with the penalty right. that they're getting. So that's kind of early, early predictions, but... Nevertheless, P6, for your thoughts? I'm thinking Haas, P6. No, sorry, Alfa Romeo, P6. I was going to say, whoa, Haas is a hot take. I'm thinking Alfa Romeo, too, yeah. I have Alfa Romeo, then Haas. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I I agree with that. I think Alfa Romeo finishes six. Haas finishes P7. Um, I believe they were P8 last year. In my opinion, um, well, I actually have it right here. Yeah, they they finished P8 last year in the constructors. I I think with the change from from Schumacher to Hulkenberg, I think they just, they gain that, you know, there's more stability in the car. And then for me, I think we ended off AlphaTauri, then Williams. I have well, Hold on, list. though. We we're forgetting one team. What about P8? I believe that would be McLaren. Oh, forgot about that. You <laughs> Oh, how Forget mighty... not the papaya, young Richie. Forget not the papaya. I think, like, a team goes from P5 to P8 as, and, and like, a McLaren team would have so much drama behind the scenes. <sighs> like, that is just, it's 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 crazy. It, it's just interesting to think that. We need a Nikki Lauda a style moment to turn this ship around you're too busy worrying about the digital advertising on your car oh, and God. performance i yeah. love that yeah and then p9 looking think... like Al- looking like alpha tauri yeah and, and then williams and then williams rounding out p10 so yeah here we go so that is our these are some predictions. spicy predictions but oh, i think I it's it. pretty pretty honest for what we've seen online like i don't think there's any well there's a couple of surprises, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm confident. I think we did really well last year too. Yeah, I think so too. So I think we are going to be in, in a good spot. Yeah. For our prediction. I'm excited to see this kind of play out. Me too. Me too. I can't but wait I- to see how the 2023 season jumps off with the Bahrain Greek GP starting this Sunday. What's up, everyone? It is Richie here just taking a break from this week's episode just to kind of want to give you guys a heads up that we're going to be talking about Drive to Survive Season 5. In the remainder of the episode so this is your spoiler alert moment and just wanted to kind of give you guys a heads up also we're going to be doing a grid rivals fantasy with our fans see who is the best fantasy leader when it comes to formula one so we're going to post the link on our instagram and also on our youtube page so you can join before the first uh, qualifying session tomorrow hope you can join and let's tune into the remainder of the episode thanks everyone Now with our preseason predictions out of the way, we're going to go back to a little bit of reviewing of last season through the eyes of Netflix. John, Erica, what are your thoughts on DTS season five? You know, I think first impressions, I've watched so far nine episodes, so I still haven't completed the whole thing. But so far, I've enjoyed kind of the structure they've have they've done on some of the episodes. I think they definitely will also, number one, Max Verstappen's back. Um, you know, one of the conversations was, 
he was not in last season. He didn't like how it was framed. So they, I guess the agreement is they brought him in. So it's good to kind of get his opinion on some of these topics that we're seeing. You know, I think I loved a couple of the banters. I just seen Mercedes on the hot seat this season. I thought episode two was really well done at the, you know, the teen principals meetings in Canada. Erica, we were literally at that Grand Prix. The fact that that happened there was pretty, I know. it was pretty exciting. Canada GP, you were there. You Both of you were there to witness, they could have been there to witness that, al- that beautiful, I thought that was absolute DTS gold. I thought there was a couple of good things. I definitely did see some misses in the season. Don't remember them talking really much about Bottas and his personal growth away from Mercedes. I felt like Christian was doing a lot of the talking for Red Bull for the most, maybe like 80% of him. And then it was just the drivers. Maybe we don't really hear much about Alex Albon coming back. And also, you know, we didn't really felt no, none of the controversy in, in Brazil was talked about between no. the Red Bull drivers. So I think there was definitely some positives in the season. I, I really loved episode one with Bonato and Gunter in Italy and a freaking What Fiat. a way to open the season. <laughs> I was like just taken aback by how awesome that whole segment was. And I would love to see a future spinoff where the both of them like fight crime or solve mysteries in like this like two by two fiat that they have like their elbows tucked in forget comedians and cars getting coffee <laughs> i want formula one former principals getting fusili or something like that and have them going around probably getting <laughs> effed up in the fiat or something like that <laughs> I just, uh, to be a fly in the backseat of that car, just not contributing, but just listening would be, I'm sure. I don't know if I would be in that car, period. (laughs) (laughs) But hey, you know, on the bright side for Benatti, there's more time to spend on his winery this year. This is very true. He's not got to worry about tire and strategy stuff anymore, so... You have to worry about what grapes go well. I think a couple other things is I think Drive to Survive was not shy from talking about some of the massive uh, risks that comes with driving. Um, you know, obviously we saw Roman Grosjean's crash in the, in the last two seasons ago, but, you know, there was a good portion of this, uh, one of the episodes fo- focusing on Joe's crash and even some of the, never not never before scenes, but I don't remember seeing such that close up of the camera in the car when it went because I remember they tried to black most of that out but you, you know and obviously how they like showed that like that same scene three episodes I think I think it was two or three episodes it was kind of the same yeah. narrative again and again and I was like a sidetrack from Drive to Survive I've been watching the full swing documentary on the PGA Tour yeah which is kind of like the DTS version for the PGA Tour and the amount of times that they mention the importance of making a cut. I'm like, this is pretty like simple stuff. They think they <laughs> mentioned it like five times, like five episodes in a row. So they kind of did the same thing here this season with the Joe crash um, for DTS. <laughs> Or Erica, what were your thoughts on DTS? Yeah, so I feel like Richie and I share some pretty similar sentiments on it. Brazil, like I, I'm always surprised. I mean, that's such a fun race and it's always exciting to watch. And I feel like it's a really big event too. So the fact that Netflix isn't there kind of boggles my mind, especially when there was some really good drama to it this year, especially on the Red Bull side. Similar to what I've seen some other people share elsewhere too. Felt like we saw more of Christian Horner's wife than we did some of the other key players in uh, that who participate in the sport. And also like, I was a little sad that there wasn't as much of a mention of Vettel's retirement as I was kind of expecting. Like even when Alonzo initially retired a couple of years ago, like they didn't make a big to do of it, but there was the whole like, Hey man, congrats. Like you could see him. He's like in his gear after a race, people are congratulating him before he takes off. Um, And that was, I think the first season of DTS too. So it's before like anyone really gave a hoot about this and before the explosion of the sport we've seen over the course of the last couple of years. So that I think that was the biggest thing that I was sad about. I mean, he he's done a lot over the course of the last few years, nevertheless, throughout his career. So, and especially they focus so much on him leaving Ferrari and going to Aston Martin. Like that was a pretty big plot point one season. So the fact that they didn't even talk about like, hey, this guy who's been like a really big deal while we've done this show is retiring was kind of surprising to me. Well, yeah. And also I think the only ca- a cameo happened was literally was when they talked about the drivers, the minute he announced his retirement, that was it. Like they had him walking out uh, and then just like, Oh, then the driver market's going to open up. But then they had that little moment of Sergio Perez, like, Oh, Seb's got Instagram. Wait, what? Like, yeah. I don't know how 
accurate that was but yeah i don't know it's kind of yeah i'm kind of bummed but also but also reminded reminded me of just how much a mess was the japanese grand prix the weather and i'm shocked that they were allowed to race that like formula like obviously there's multiple mentions of of the japanese grand prix throughout multiple episodes but just like just reminded me it's like how is that raceable just so dangerous like you know, I, I know there's like a lot of negatives that you probably try to show. To be honest with you, I I found myself laughing quite a bit during the Drive to Survive episodes, especially seeing like Gun- Gunther Steiner was a star this season in his house in North Carolina. And like, um, but he's loving life over there. Oh, loving life, and just the the Fiat scene, and then in episode two when they're all, when when Toto is bashing them, like <laughs> it is just like some schoolyard brawl <laughs> in terms of just war of words at each other. It's just the pettiness was unbelievable. I had to rewatch it a few times because I was laughing so hard on for like, just for that and just the, the amount of talking and shit talking between everybody was great. I think it was also interesting because you know, so much focus was on Gunter this season, but like even they put the camera to Max Albon, uh, Alex, sorry, not Max, Alex Albon. He's like, why you put the camera on me? Gunter's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you I lo- what, though, I don't envy Gunther Steiner having to call Gene Haas after every, every race, race and just explain <laughs> stupidity happened that day. <laughs> like that, like he's got to be like, oh, I got to f, I got to like call Gene again. <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh man, do you remember when they went to Miami and then Roman Groshan's like, oh, I'm your UPS driver? <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> I thought also too this season. They did a good job depicting the drama between Alpine and McLaren. Yeah. I have, I thought Otmar was kind of a little, I, I thought he had a little bit of this spotlight this season. I'm going to go to my local cafe and get a skinny cappuccino with cinnamon and call the Otmar Safnar, you know, <laughs> that the power drink in the morning. Cause that's, I just loved it when he was like, can we get a skinny cappuccino with some cinnamon on top and how he was ironing his like every shirt to make it perfect. I was like, I never knew that there was that side to Otmar. And I thought that that was hilarious, but also I think they made <laughs> Uh, I uh, some negatives are though. I guess to me they made McLaren look like a bunch of assholes. I don't know if you both feel the same way. Yeah, I also kind of feel like McLaren were a bunch of assholes last year. So. Fair. But and then also I think they targeted the the stupidest drama between Red Bull. Yeah, they didn't even pick the right one. Like with like that episode with regards to the Monaco Grand Prix and how you know it was like I had to like look back at the season because. The, the way they were just down talking Checo before that race, I was like, was he that bad? And I'm like, oh, wait, you know, he had three P2 finishes, one retirement where it was the Browning GP and they both retired on the same incident. I think he had a third and fourth place finish. I'm like, what's the problem here? And then, like, yeah. there was like no drama after it's like, oh, we signed his contract after the race. It was kind of like done. I'm just like, there was the there was Brazil <laughs> like there was Brazil and to bring it back to Brazil too like I I was just looking it up and other notable moments for some of the other teams that didn't get captured that they missed in that one George Russell's first win they showed and like also 20 seconds of Haas and you know Magnuson getting pole position I know it doesn't necessarily need to be a central plot point but again we've talked a lot about those drivers in the past like Russell has like, that's what I just don't understand how people who were central over the course of several seasons suddenly <laughs> meant nothing. Also, if you're so, wondering why we're laughing, my cat is absolutely doing his darndest to rip my headphones off my, my head right now. <laughs> but my favorite is speaking about Russell is when he's standing in front when they're doing the car uh, when they're doing the car photos before the first race, and everyone is coming by and like yeah. literally ripping the Mercedes car to shreds. <laughs> And he's just standing like, there and he's just standing he's like, as long as it goes fast. Because everyone's got these side pods and the Mercedes did the non-side pod look and everyone is just, he's like, oh yeah, it looks like a fast car. You could tell he's just, he, he's like, it doesn't look like a fast car. <laughs> 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 no, there were some definitely memeable moments. I think the memeable moments are the Fiat driver with the driving of the Fiat car. It was the, it was Christian Horner's you know, reply to Toto about fixing the car. And then I also think another good memeable moment, to me, one of the funniest DTS moments was Sergio Perez's reaction to to Seb's retirement. 
<laughs> the music that built up to the moment and what he looked like at the end it was so good it had that like office-esque vibes that he the face that he made in that 2017 f1 debrief um <laughs> after the after the singapore grand prix it had the exact sort of feel to it and i thought that was great but yes if um i hate to break it to you john but the I don't like the, the final episode is all about Abu Dhabi and not much really happened at Abu Dhabi. It's kind of like the goodbye sort of idea. They could have tied in Brazil much better there and done like an hour long episode. I would have watched the full thing. Well, that's good to know. Thanks, man. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> but that's definitely the, uh, that, that's our review of Drive to Survive season five. Uh, it sounds like the, they've re-signed a contract for season six and the beginning of that content will begin this week because it's race week. What? What? Can't harp how much excited we are about race week. So we've done this week. We've done this this week in F1. We've done our F1 season projections. We did our DTS review. It is now time for the Bahrain GP. So final thoughts, team, before we head into the beginning of the season. Come to Trinity Common at 10 a.m. to watch the race and watch all of our predictions go down the toilet. That's all I'm going to (laughs) say. I think you mean for watch Fernando Alonso finish P1. So uh, he's retiring this season. Maybe that that's literally what I'm going to say. You lose. Erica, comment. I oh, come cry with me, McLaren fans. Let's go weep in the back of the corner. <laughs> now you know what it's going to be like to have, be like an Aston Martin fan for the past two years. Yeah, but at least we had, like, you didn't have hope. You that's true. lose. <laughs> hot take i think for orlando norris takes over the position at mercedes when lewis hamilton retires well i'm just gonna i'm just gonna say in drive to survive christian horner hinted at uh, orlando norris being replaced replacing sergio perez (laughs) who knows we'll see I don't know. Christian Horner has said that Piastri is one of those kind of like once in a lifetime talent type things. So I don't know. Maybe one of the McLaren boys will be moving in the near future. But regardless, we're going to cry in the back of the bar. We're going to cry in the back of the bar. McLaren's going to cry in the back of the bar. I'm crying in the back of the bar. (laughs) Well, with that said, thank you very much, everybody, for listening to season three, episode two of the F1 podcast. We always appreciate the support. So please follow us on Instagram at F1.podcast. Follow us on Apple Spotify, Apple, oh God, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Looking forward to the Bahrain GP race one of the 2023 calendar year, where who knows what might happen. Hey, Lando Norris might score in the points. We'll find out. (laughs) Thanks, everybody, for listening. And see you Sunday at Trinity Common for the 10 a.m. start.